So, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the ILD webinar on circular economy. My name is Tomasz Babicki, and I'm working on the regulatory affairs at the ILD Europe office in Brussels. Um, with that, let me introduce you uh, to our panelists today. So we have um, two lighting designers, um, Christine Bredal uh, from Oslo, Norway, and uh, Kevin Shaw in Edinburgh, Scotland. Hi. And then we have one representative of uh, a lighting manufacturer, Matthew Cobham uh, from Erco, and Hi. he's based in uh, France. So thank you uh, to you uh, for joining us today. Uh, and before we uh, start asking questions uh, to the panelists, I would uh, like to um, set the stage a little bit by talking briefly uh, about some uh, basic principles of circular economy and what circular economy is. So really uh, the, main, uh, the main principle is that we need to reduce waste on our planet, right? So, uh, and this is not only an environmental concern, but also an economic one. And because saving resources uh, saves money and uh, also waste is a valuable source. And uh, so closing really the, the circle of how we produce and, and consume stuff uh, involves many different uh, steps and, and processes. So really starting with the product design and, and manufacturing in a true circular economy, uh, products need, need to be made with uh, recycled content preferably and be designed to, to last. Um, then um, during the use phase, um, it should be uh, possible to uh, use products as long as uh, it is possible by repairing and uh, and uh, doing maintenance, uh, but also um, by uh, reusing and, and uh, secondhand use. And then, of course, uh, at the end of life, uh, products need to be uh, allowed for for remaking into something else, or uh, they need to be allowed. Uh, uh, for, for proper uh, recycling. Um, and as circular economy is a big uh, priority uh, for the European Union uh, for the next couple of years, we at IL Europe we will be uh, following closely uh, what the EU is going to do and how they will implement uh, all these uh, different principles into European uh, regulations. Um, so well, many of those plans are still on paper, uh, but uh, I think it's worth looking at them already now. And uh, I will now give the floor to my colleague, Margot, uh, who will give us an update on what the uh, plans of the EU uh, are for the next couple of years. Margot. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so as uh, Thomas uh, just introduced you to the concept of circular economy, I will uh, briefly explain what is the EU doing about circular economy and what is relevant for lighting. Uh, so the EU has adopted in March of this year a circular economy action plan, which is part of a broader initiative called the Green Deal. So what is relevant for lighting uh, in this action plan? So the first uh, initiative that you can see on the slide uh, is to have more sustainable uh, products. So the idea is here to really design products that are more sustainable so you start from the very early stages of the process so the design stage uh, in order to allow producers to make products that are more circular the purpose here would be to increase the reuse repair and recycle process and to improve the durability upgradeability recyclability etc of the products so in this kind of initiative, we could see some sort of uh, sustainability scoring of products. 
a second initiative that is uh, in this circular economy action plan and very relevant for the lighting sector is the right to repair. So here, the idea is to uh, empower the consumers, uh, is to provide the consumers, citizens with cost saving opportunities. So this go through um, giving more transparent information to the consumers. So at the point of sale, but also more transparent information on the lifespan of products, the availability of repair services, spare parts and repair manuals. Uh, a third initiative uh, that uh, is also relevant is uh, that the EU might review the legislation on the restriction of the use of certain hazardous substances in electrical and electric equipment. So the idea behind this would be to prevent waste, uh, to have cleaner waste streams, to increase recycled content and have high quality recycling. Uh, the first one is to have a uh, construction that is more sustainable, so such as the EU renovation wave uh, that would bring investments into new buildings and into re renovations, so which could mean also a boost for uh, new lighting projects. And last but not least, um, which could uh, impact the, the lighting sector, is uh, that with circular economy, we would see some new business models appearing uh, in, uh, in the economy, such as a product as a service. So what would this mean for lighting is that we would shift from lighting products uh, to lighting as a service. Uh, very briefly to conclude, and as uh, Thomas said, uh, I know this, concepts of policy, legislative development might be a bit overwhelming, but this is still very early stages of the process. Uh, it still has to be drafted by the European Commission and to go through the European Parliament and Council. So this means plenty of opportunity for stakeholders to be involved and to provide comments. Um, so as ILD, of course, we will uh, closely monitor the evolutions and uh, be involved if needed in order to make sure that ILD interests are covered. Thank you, Margot. And uh, um, continuing on that, uh, just to say that uh, we have now uh, drafted our ILD position paper on uh, on all of those uh, issues. Uh, so we should uh, we should be ready for that. Uh, I hope uh, our paper will be published uh, sometime soon. So uh, keep tuned to that if you're interested. So now I think we can turn um, to our panelists, and I would like to start by asking um, um, you uh, each of you uh, a question, uh, um, a more personal question maybe. And that is which uh, single aspect or impact of the circular economy model will be the most influential in, in your work personally. Um, can I start with you, Christine? Uh, yes, hello. Um, well, um, I think for my company and for me, uh, the, the, the most important aspect is the actual um, rules and regulation and, and this uh, new Green Deal that I think is fantastic. And it's really um, a game changer for everybody. Uh, I have personally always been very concerned with the, the environment uh, as a lighting designer and I uh, now feel that uh, this can be really be beneficial for us as lighting designers that we can sharpen our tools and and uh, be important as consultants um, and the fact now that it will be much easier to to promote uh, and to push our clients towards solutions that uh, embraces the circular economy i think that's fantastic there's a lot of uh, <laughs> practical uh, issues to be solved, but um, I'm very, very optimistic and hopeful with this uh, um, new um, Green Deal. Uh, so should I send forward to Kevin, maybe? Yeah, thanks. Um, what single aspect? Um, the thing that I think uh, 
uh, that already has impact in our practice and things we've already looked to do and tried to do is aspects of reuse of existing equipment. Um, we managed to achieve this on one project actually nearly 10 years ago. Uh, and at that time, it was an incredible struggle and there's incredible resistance from the industry to provide spare parts for what were then 15 year old pieces of equipment. Um, we've seen this again, uh, where we've tried to reuse stuff and not been able to get things uh, repaired or spare parts availability going forward. So I, I think us looking closely at projects and seeing what is practical to reuse, especially on a refurbishment, um, is an important part of our practice already. So I'd, I'd like to follow that forward. Matthew? Yeah, thank, thanks, Kevin. Um, so I think there are a couple of a uh, couple of aspects there which will be particularly influential, um, all, all in one, if you like, all under the umbrella of longevity. Uh, so making things or making lighting, good quality lighting, last as long as well as uh, last as long as possible with uh, consistent performance. So I think you know in the kind of if you like the manufacturing process. That's the key topic that uh, you know, the people I'm working with anyway will be will be fo focusing on. And then I kind of a I, I, I guess a topic closely related to that, really for the for the industry, is about information as well linked to that. So making sure that fair information, you know, kind of apples to apples information is also provided for end users specifiers. So I think it's it's a combination of those those aspects. uh thank you um that was uh, that was very interesting i propose here that we uh try a feature that we have uh, in in this uh, uh in this webinar which is a uh possibility to conduct a survey or a poll uh, among uh, the attendees so uh if we can uh put up a question um to to the audience um i'm trying to put the, the poll on um so the question is if after um this uh coronavirus crisis um how much uh the, the clients will seek the inclusions of uh, sustainability criteria in lighting projects uh, so we have three uh, options here, if, um, if more or less or same as before. Do uh, one of you have a, one of you panelists, do you have a view on uh, on this? Uh, Matthew, maybe, do you want to? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think that, uh, of course, <laughs> the entire world has been in complete turmoil for the last months, and that's going to continue for a long time. Um, and you know, if we talk about sustainability, well, one of the you know the key elements of that is just as you know, kind of a little bit, as I mentioned in, in answer to the first question, is that you know, lighting solutions, lighting products, and everything around it that can be kind of sustained as long as possible because of course there is a you know a sustainability in that that uh, you have a solution which is going to last for a long period of time and certainly kind of you know initial discussions you know i've had with people across the industry uh, you know, even with, with good competitors if you like they seem to all agree that you know, people want uh, there's more interest now to make investments in things which are going to last longer going to be kind of safer safer investments if you like so you know i hope anyway that's going to be one of the positive things that comes out of this <laughs> this big mess that we've all been thrown into thank you i think we have uh, um some numbers here i think uh people are generally thinking that uh um we will see uh, more of those uh more of those requests. 55% of our attendees think uh, we will see more of those. 38, uh, same as before, and only 8% that uh, uh, there will be less uh, less sustainability after the crisis. 
Um, Can I have a comment on yes. that? Um, because I think that the, uh, the crisis um, made us all sit down and think a lot about many things in life. And uh, I, I certainly hope that we can see uh, this as an opportunity to, to, to restart some things or to uh, propel the, uh, some, some good, uh, investigate good, good ways of saving the planet that we need to do. And it's not about lasting longer on, it's lasting forever <laughs> uh, that, we, that we want the products to be. And, um, and I think that maybe, you know, in times of crisis, people are more um, creative and can come up with uh, both business ideas and solutions that will embrace this um, sustainable uh, future that we need to do. So uh, I'm hopeful um, because I think that, uh, you know, the, the crisis has really set the whole uh, whole life in perspective in a new way and that also includes us as uh, in the lighting business that's my hope thank you for that christine uh kevin do you want to jump in uh, on, on that as well or should we move forward i would like to think that uh the COVID shakeup will make people more aware of uh, environmental aspects uh, in terms of circular economy. Yes, I mean the reuse aspect, the what we're using, how we're using it. Uh, I think uh, we have seen a huge change in in what we've been up to uh, travel, particularly, and doing things like this uh, online have, have really come up very quickly. So I'm hopeful that if we can do this really quickly and get comfortable and useful with it when we start to get back to doing physical projects a bit more we will be able to do the same sort of things and use the same kind of thinking and also possibly because we've seen quick incredibly rapid change in a lot of things people might be able to more change and open to discussion of the different rather than the same as before and then that would help us most yeah and perhaps i can just add something to what uh, kevin has just mentioned there i think you know of course all of us have been working online a lot more and i think that that hopefully will bring some benefits in just being able to communicate more easily on topics like this where you know it's been left sometimes with months at a time uh you know with big gaps where we haven't discussed topics like this and hopefully that will become more fluid much more you know much more convenient for people to talk about it yeah I, I do think we have to really work a lot harder on collaborating around the planet, all the good forces in the industry and, and in the profession to, to propel this uh, development. So let's hope it's going to uh, be an opportunity for everyone to, to move forward. Uh, let's move uh, a little bit into the, the weeds of, uh, of the topic uh, with the second question, um, which is what needs to be done and by who in order to incentivize reusability, refurbishment, rep repairs and secondhand markets in the lighting sector, while at the same time uh, encouraging uh, uh, innovation. Um, I thought Matthew would be the best to start on, on this one. <laughs> Great. Thanks for that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think so now, you know, talking for the industry, if you like, overall, this, this is clearly uh, a very uh, challenging uh, topic because, uh, you know, all manufacturers want to, to sell, uh, sell, you know, more, more products or, you know, keep selling products, if you, if you, if you like. And the, there's clearly, you know, a, a balance to be found there because, as you mentioned, it's kind of hinted at in your question, which I'm very happy about. Is, is the point about innovation. Um, so, you know, while of course it is it is absolutely great and should be fully encouraged that uh, materials should be used in the manufacturing process, which which can be easily recycled, uh, etc. Um, and why not also for for products even to be reused on project on, pro, uh, on projects? I'll come back to that point in a second. It's also essential for everybody and of benefit to everybody 
that there is innovation, you know, quality of light, optical performance, just being two parts of, of that. Um, coming to addressing the, the question directly about refurbishment, you know, it may be an obvious answer or part of the answer anyway to this is that very often, um, you know, not all of a project gets refurbished in one go. Uh, we all know that, you know, a lot of projects projects happen in different stages very often simply because there isn't the money there to do everything all in one go. There could be and there are opportunities there uh, for where parts of a project get refurbished with the latest thing, which may bring new performances, new benefits for the end user, etc. Then for the some of the existing products that are there, rather than being maybe just sent away for recycling, which by the way, that might be an option as well. They could be used in uh, other parts of the project to apps update those. Uh, and so you kind of get into a kind of a sort of positive circle, if you like, or, on projects where you know it's sort of being being updated and gradually anyway, the oldest, lowest performing uh, products are you know going for recycling, and of course they should be recycled in the right way. So maybe the, there's a model there which uh, can be incentivized. So let's have a hand over to Christine. What, what do you think, Christine? Well, I think that the, uh, the big driving force uh, for uh, this change will be the public sector. Um, they will set the tone that the, the client needs to, to demand uh, and then the industry has to deliver. At least in Europe, I think this will be the, the case. And <clears throat> Already now, uh, well, you, um, about 30% um, of the score for buildings can be directly related to the to the environment and sustainability in in buildings, and we now see that the public project that uses bonuses, climate bonuses, like the road uh, department in in Norway is now using climate bonus if the contractor managed to um, have better um, climate budget uh, than than the um, client demands, then they will actually get cash money for it. And I think that those are great incentives, and that can uh, that should start from the public sector, and it will come from the public sector. And then I think also for the for the private sector, this. Um, just the, the the brand making i mean you have to be be good in this these issues to to promote your um, your company so i think this is becoming increasingly important also in the private sector and and but, these will be the drivers mm. yeah but if i could just add also to what christian was, was saying there i think that you, you mentioned the kind of the, the sort of promotion and marketing aspects there um and just but to sort of you know, chip, chip in on that point. I think that there needs to be some method also to somehow control in the right way misinformation because there are, oh, yeah. you know, it's kind of disreputable, whatever we want, however we want to define that, uh, manufacturers out there who, yeah, they might be talking a lot about circular economy, but they're not necessarily actually doing very much about it. Uh, and some manufacturers who are actually doing a lot, uh, and they're not necessarily promoting it um so that, that i think that's a really good point so we have to be able to control the result i mean there is there is lawsuits already you know in the market about things being promised that hasn't been held and and so we we as a profession need to really work hard to to be able to to help specify the the products and to evaluate the 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 bids and to then also help the client to control the result in the end. So it's a lot of work to be done there. Sorry, Kevin. Thanks. Um, well, I think we don't need to look back very far to see to have seen a wholesale revolution within the lighting industry. Um, the whole change over to LEDs not only has been a technical change, it's also been a very huge commercial change. And the fallout of that has been radical change to the big players in the European lighting industry. Largely, this has been driven through regulation through eco design. And what we are seeing, and why we're talking about this, is the circular economy is being flagged up by the EU as 
a major part of forthcoming regulation. So essentially what we're seeing, or what we should be seeing, is, well, if the last lot of regulations did X to the lighting industry, is the lighting industry now going to be swift enough to look at what they need to do to move into this next layer of change that's driven by regulation? So things like reusability, refurbishment, repairs, and secondhand, the lighting industry needs to look at how they can provide those things, how they can change their business model in order to accommodate that. If they don't do that quickly, then sadly, some of the bigger older players are going to get another kicking like they had from LEDs. And they're going to have, they will find other new companies coming in who will focus on that and take away more of their marketplace. Now, encouraging innovation, uh, yes, and not just the commercial innovation, but new products or ways of inventively reusing products is going to be innovative. And I think as lighting designers, we need to play a big part in this. Like if we go into a building and we see a lot of equipment that could be reused, what would be the way to reuse that equipment in the best way to provide good lighting? Because lighting is light, it's not equipment. And we shouldn't really be thinking that we have to replace all equipment everywhere in order to get good lighting. Uh, yeah. Use how we use it and what it will do, um, especially if we're looking at something in its second life, for example. Uh, we know, for example, if we look at a very basic thing like a, a 600 by 600 lay-in scheme, if it's an LED system, if it's halfway through its life, we know that its light output will be up to 30% lower in the second half of life. So if we have controls, we can accommodate that. Uh, we maybe want to supplement lighting in some way to um, allow us to keep the majority of lighting there. I mean, there's lots of things we could do as designers to try and figure out how to make best use of equipment that's already there or can be reused or moved around, like Matthew was saying, from one bit to another bit of a, a building. Um, in terms of innovation of equipment, the other thing to look at is how can new equipment be made so that it fulfills an initial function, but it's also designed so that it could fulfill other functions, either by replacing parts, and I think optics has been talked about as a, a very interesting area to look at having changeability, or just through control. Um, we have seen products offered to the marketplace that had those kind of facilities built in, um, unfortunately, they, they never got really beyond prototype. They've never actually been offered into market. If you put a ceiling full of uh, essentially digitally alterable luminaires, you can change the focus, you can change the LEDs they've been using, change the color temperatures, all those things, then they're bound to have more future flexibility should you want to come back into that building and repurpose it, use it for something else, change the style or whatever else. Matthew? Yeah. So, so also you know, add, add, add a little point in there, which is that there is, of course, the recyclability after uh, the sort of end of use or life or whatever of the the material in a, in a project. So clearly, that's very important. There is also the uh, recyclability, reusability of materials actually during the manufacturing process. Um, and I would suggest that that shouldn't get forgotten in this whole thing about circular economy because the amount of waste that can happen anyway during a manufacturing process is potentially huge um and you know anyway you know the the reputable manufacturers anyway think about this um and then you know for example let's take optics as being one example where you know you need the best materials to start off with to get if you, if you want to have high performance products um but what happens to all the waste there? There are plenty of industries which don't need the very, very high optical performance of plastics and, and, and metals and so on. And they, but they can be used in kind of not secondary industries, but other industries which just don't need the purity, for example, of materials. So that's also an element to that hopefully should be considered in this. Uh, yeah, I'm um, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Matthew, I think I think that happens quite a lot. I mean, I, I remember touring, in fact, touring round lamp plants uh, in in the last hurrah of the conventional technology. 
all of those lamp plants were very, very focused on reusing the materials that we're using. So all the glass was kept in process. Once it landed in the site, offcuts were recycled mostly on site, unless they'd been contaminated, and then they had to get rid of them or take them off site to recycle them. Um, plastics, I think, are the big problem. What do we do? Metal is easy to, to work with, easy to rework, and easy to recycle. Um, and I agree. I mean, waste from optical plastics, I mean, you can keep that in the same circuit as well. I mean, if you're making a diffusing lens, you don't need the high optical quality, but you want to use the same kind of material. So again, designing within the process to be able to tailor some of your products to use the material that you're not using the primary product is, is a very doable and encourageable thing. Kristen. Uh, yeah, well, I was just thinking that uh, <clears throat> maybe we need more of um, um, punishment and carrots uh, for as incentives to for the industry to to make products that are more easily uh, dismantled for reuse and and recycling. Um, so if it's you know if it can't be reused and it can't be dismantled, then then it should be really expensive to throw it away so that would be an incentive also for the clients to to mm. choose uh, uh, better equipment um, but uh, first and foremost I, I think that uh, we as lighting designers really need to take a step back and and, and make sure that we use uh, uh, the right equipment and make the right choice and, and to and ensure the quality and also that uh, you know if we look at what's you know the amount of lighting light that's out there it's just so much too much light it's just way too much light out there we have to reduce I mean we really have to do it and uh, uh, if you don't start now, I don't know. I mean, I think we should force some darkness upon the world, uh, you know, yeah. a few weeks every year to 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 really just reflect over the way and understand of the overuse of, of light and also then lighting equipment and more pollution and everything. So, yeah, there's many things <laughs> we need to do. Yes, match it. Yeah, just uh, again, also just to, to add to that. So, so you know, great if we have some some dark days uh, during the year. Of course, that that's that's a great great idea. Um, but and also just getting light where it's needed as well. So this this is the whole point that I kind of touched on earlier about you know optical performance. What you know we've all touched on. So just having light where you want it, and then having darkness where you want it, and that all comes down to you know good quality optical control, basically, uh, or partly anyway, and good design, of course. Uh, so you know those those things really work hand in hand. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, let's move on to uh, next uh, next question, uh, which is. How do we increase the acceptance and adoption of uh, reused and secondhand lighting equipment by our clients? Kevin, do, would you like to start on this one? Oh, <laughs> uh, dear. Um, this, I think, is another very, very major thing. Uh, we, the first problem we, we have always is budget. So we need to find routes or the, the market needs to support that to make it economically uh, helpful and economically advantageous to start looking at um, reused, reusing equipment within the project or buying in secondhand equipment. Now one of the barriers to that is immediately going to be, well, how long is it going to last from now? Uh, what, you know, what guarantees have we got? what process is there for providing maintenance for equipment in that situation. Now that's uh, a big, the big problem, it's a, it's a big gap in the circular economy going forward. You cannot expect any rational, reasonable, honest lighting manufacturer to say, to extend warranties indefinitely. You can't expect them to uh, you know, to say beyond a certain point that they can continue to support a piece of equipment. But we need to have some things in play in order to determine what those parameters are 
on how we can make a good economic cost for reusing equipment. Areas that are being discussed by the EU in terms of this, uh, as, as was mentioned, are things like um, uh, right to repair, uh, repairability, the, the requirement to stock parts from 10, uh, I think the current number is 10 years beyond the last placing on the market of a product. Uh, in fact, the way that is going to be written is that any product at any point that you place on the market, 10 years forward from that point, that piece of equipment has to be able to be repaired and replacement parts provided. Now that's something that got, was coming to this argument, and the 10 years thing comes to the argument from legislation that was put in place, uh, oh, heading for 20 years ago for the motor industry, because there was a larger problem which still exists to an extent of being able to get spare parts for your older car. And at that point, 10 years was the expected life of a car. And I think that's now changed. And I think there's another argument for that, uh, about that. Um, one of the things that impacts cars that will impact lighting in the future is not just the physicality of the product and the parts to light it up, to make the, you know, the gear to work and all the rest of it. It's the software content. As we go forward, there's more and more software content going into lighting. Uh, a lot of conversation right now about uh, things like DALI 2. Uh, that is a, a digital standard. Uh, we have um, all the Bluetooth things, and we're already seeing within the short length of time that those have been on the market that upgrades are beginning to appear, uh, which will stop which you will not get the full functionality with equipment that was built to the initial standard. Now that is an ongoing thing. We've all seen this through software, computers, and all the rest of it. But if we're looking at a long-term life for light fitting, that also means the 10-year thing has to apply to software. and has to apply to the uh, manufacturers of software-based products, keeping it compatible with the way computers, phones, tablets, and all the rest of it are upgraded. So that's another big thing, and I can't help seeing that being a, a big chunk of the uh, of the future circular economy is uh, ongoing you know, support and development of existing products. Matthew. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to just put my finger up there. <laughs> yeah. So well, then then I would just you know bring in the idea of kind of you know future proof. Uh, products or trying to make them as future proof as possible because obviously what's going to, is going to be in say 20 years plus time you know we we don't know uh, that that's the truth but at least for quite some period of time anyway we know that there are different protocols that have come, come out so there, are, there are some already there or you know there's no point in mentioning the names some are going to kind of be, you know become the vhs's some are going to kind of kind of be, going to become the beta maxes if you like that's fine but Having um, products that are already designed in such a way that they're future-proof and then can adapt to that change um, fully makes sense. So, you know, I, I would fully, uh, fully agree with that. Um, that was the one part. The, the other part, I just wanted to link in with another comment you made earlier, Kevin, about, uh, for example, stocking parts. So, yes you know that, that that's completely uh completely understandable um i think a, another element that needs to also be at least considered brought into the the discussion is that if you have spare parts they need to be stored somewhere they need to get transported to wherever the project is and there is an overall if you like sustainability question here if we're talking about real sustainability not just uh, you know, meeting something that's in writing, which okay, is very important. But if we're really concerned about uh, achieving real sustainability, then it is about, you know, considering that whole uh, value chain, which is, I mean, you know, that is why I started off by mentioning the point about not having designed obsolescence at the beginning. So you have something that can last as long as possible and great if it can be used in another part of a project some years later, well, perhaps something new for some reason comes into a, a you know a refurbished part of the project, then that you know maybe that can be a solution, part of the solution anyway. All right, uh, I need to come back on this straight away. What we have seen as a result of COVID 
in the extremely present is that parts for ventilators have been made on 3D printing equipment uh, in order to make those things work and they've been done locally and that's work. We've seen PPE elements, mask frames, being made on three, you know, 3D printers, crowdsourced. So really, it's back to this idea of innovation. What we need to start looking at, or what you need to start looking at as manufacturers, is, well, okay, if we have a commitment to replace parts for whatever, what can we do at the outset by making those not just um, easy to source, but to save us stocking them, we make them 3D printable. Or and We only know that 3D printing is going to get better, easier, have a wider variety of materials. But if you make the parts not for manufacture necessarily, but if you have the ability to make parts on 3D printing and you create the, the pattern for that at the time of, uh, at the time of manufacture, the fitting initially, storing a, a USB stick with all the parts for Luminera's files to be plunked out on a 3D printer solves immediately the entire argument and stocking problem about parts, you know, replacement parts for anything over any length of time. So innovation, yes, there's, a, there's an idea for innovation that could be done now, from now, for pretty much anything. You just this solved the problem then. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> no, but I think it's really important to get together and discuss these things because it, it is obviously very, very complicated, but there is solutions to it if you get together and, and talk about it. I also think that um, the acceptance uh, uh, with it, for the clients, I, I think there is a lot of will in, in, uh, in, for many clients to, to take over used equipment. I actually just tried now in a project uh, that they, they were all eager to do it because it was uh, quite new equipment and it could be reused. But just the, the, the problems with the warranties uh, and the contractors made it so that they, they pulled out in the last, last minute. But what I experience is that the clients are actually, uh, if you know, if this is was ready, you know, a bit earlier in this project, it would could have happened, and I think it will happen. But we also need to have though the, the the distribution line from the 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 older equipment and how it can be um, repaired or checked, and then you know somehow either sell it super cheap without a warranty or you know find a way of uh, securing the, the, the quality um, but it's also you know really important to say well you know here maybe we can use uh, um, recycle but we don't advise it here you know that we you know that with the, so that we make sure that it would it won't be good for our business as lighting designers if we if we suggest to reuse uh, old equipment that then it's going to be you know um, a disaster that would be horrible <laughs> so yeah uh, yeah I, I can say we've had a project recently where brand new equipment has been a disaster um yeah. so this you know it it doesn't help it hasn't helped our reputation for having specified that equipment and you know we did all the due diligence on it it came from a major manufacturer and we've got very embarrassed about it and we've had to do an awful lot of work to to get the, the stuff made good and I mean it's going on it's an ongoing problem but you know yes yeah, second-hand equipment giving people confidence in it is is going to be the problem uh, again this is this is, comes back to innovation of supply chain in this case the big manufacturers could do this quite easily they could take on um, a refurbishment thing they could subcontract refurbishing and given where they are in the in the piece, it's quite easy for them to get the insurance back warranty for something that has gone through a process that they have agreed will provide additional life, or a checking process even will provide additional life. Christ's sake, the car industry again, every second hand car these days comes with a warranty. So it's not impossible, it's a business model that is not currently in the lighting industry. 
but we want the lighting industry to start thinking about it and picking it up. Well, this is all fascinating. Uh, I've been through uh, uh, some of the questions that are actually coming in. Uh, there's one interesting that I would like to bring up now. Um, it's from Louis Denton, if I can uh, mention the name. Um, do you believe that specifiers would actively choose a particular manufacturer's product over another's based on the ability to get spare parts in the future uh, or the product's uh, ability to be recycled? And if so, will specifiers be the driving force behind more sustainable, sustainable products? Yes, 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 certainly yes. Um, <laughs> we again, we do this already to an extent. We we have already done one project where we figured out a design life was required for about twenty five years. So we did that. We went to manufacturers, told them what we wanted, and eventually we got one who agreed to support the product and with spare parts and everything else for 25 years. And that beca it became something that that client was particularly keen on, the reason being that their previous lighting equipment was at that stage 12 years old. And the manufacturer of that lighting equipment had told them, well, we can't support that product anymore. We're not making parts for it. Yeah, you can do what you like with it, um, but any, any of the specific parts of it, and that included I mean, it was made of aluminium castings and machinings. They said, we can't replace, replace those, we can't provide spares of those or anything. So they, they were caught after what they thought was a very short time on a new building with a scheme where they had a high reliability requirement that couldn't be maintained. So from the outset, our goal was to determine what a reasonable life would be and then design the system and to a large extent the light fittings and work with the supplier to design the light fittings to provide the reliability and for them to undertake five-year warranty but thereafter to support the product with parts with services that they would charge for uh, for the remaining part of you know, the next 20 years or so. Uh, so yes it can be done yes if we push it um, I mean in terms of the uh, the question about uh, Yes, people have answered. Um, in terms of content of fittings, that's something else we ask the questions about. And it's sometimes very difficult to get manufacturers to be honest about where they are sourcing materials. Sometimes they don't know. And to be perfectly frank, there's an awful lot of sub assemblies coming in from the Far East, and they can't hand on heart confirm that that particular piece of extrusion, that particular casting, uh, that particular circuit board, uh, they, they don't have full traceability on that. So they can't be totally honest about it. Um, so, yeah, Matthew. Yeah, so just picking up on that point, actually, about the, you know, the, the overall kind of supply chain and linking also to, to the, the question that, um, you know, I, I think that, yes, it, it can be specified and it's also great if uh the right information is there uh for specifiers to to, to know where product the, the materials are being sourced um in relation to where they're being finally kind of put together so that there is you know visibility on that because clearly that's in in the benefit to the benefit of everybody for certainly for the end user uh, certainly for the for the specifier because they they have you know they can control liability uh, there and you know it's uh, it's really a win win it can be a win win. Yeah, we we really need absolute uh, uh, transparency on 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 all the products and all the rare earth materials and everything, uh, uh, and uh, and it's absolutely agree i absolutely agree with kevin that it's us as specifiers that we really need to <laughs> to push this forward and help our clients with with making the right choices but then we also need to know that we are fed the the, the right information and uh, and and as it can be traceable and and checkable and yeah controllable so so i think a lot can be done 
just maybe briefly to add to that point, uh, because we haven't mentioned anything about surveillance agencies, and it links you know, perfectly perhaps within what linked to what Christian and also what Sir Kevin mentioned, you know, and what we said at the beginning, you know, th there is a lot of misinformation out there. And there are some really great manufacturers uh, providing uh, transparency on these processes. And there are some that are uh, talking a lot about it, uh, but and then not as necessarily doing the right things. Uh, so uh, that's a point of, you know, can surveillance agencies are able to control, uh, you know, people or organizations that are uh, supplying things where they've misled the end users of the, the specifiers, you know, is a, maybe a way to deal with this. And it already is, but it needs to be, uh, you know, pumped up, added to. Well, that's criminal. Uh, we're getting to uh, to one hour of our session, so I'd like to cover the last uh, question that we have prepared, uh, which is, uh, I think maybe it was been partly already answered, but uh, can the use of recycled materials and recyclability of uh, lighting uh, products, lighting fittings, be among the requirements in lighting specifications? Um, should I uh, start with Christine this time as well? I I think uh, I think we can we, we can just put forth the idea and try it and see. Yes, yes, it absolutely can, uh, especially recycled materials. Um, but uh, maybe also um, fittings to some extent. But uh, uh, why not? I mean that uh, we just need to figure out the practicalities about this and, and the systems that we need to put in place to, to make it happen. Uh, I think we can, we should try to be as radical as possible to, to really try to make sure that everything is in the circle uh, and, and is being reused because we cannot exploit the planet anymore. So, um, so we really have to put all good forces to it. And I think this is a really good opportunity for, for lighting designers to put themselves in the lead uh, of this process, uh, to, to both you know, be in contact with the, uh, with the, with the clients and the industry and, and really be a part of driving it forward. What do you think, Kevin? Uh, yeah. Uh... It depends how you're writing a specification. If you're writing a product-based specification, you have to interrogate the manufacturer and get them to tell you what the content is before you write your specification. If you're writing a performance specification, however, yes, why not? You can do, but then you've got to be certain that the, the person who's interpreting and purchasing from that specification will actually follow through the uh, you know, what you have written, which isn't doesn't always happen, as you know. And the dreaded thing mm. called VE quite often kills the nice to haves. Uh, and this, I think, would largely be a nice to have unless somebody says it's something else. Um, I've not ever said materials must be recycled in specification, but I have determined life, I have determined uh, specific materials to be used within a specification for, uh, for custom light fittings more than anything else. When you're trying to do something that that's original. So, yeah, uh, it, in the right specification, yes, of course we can do this and we should do this. Matthew? Yeah, so I'll just, just kind of add to that and say that, you know, yes, I, I, think, it, I think it can be. And then I think, it, you know, it's worth, you know, kind of re repeating that this, this point that we also, you know, we started with, which, which was partly about information being there for everybody uh, that's concerned in the design process. So, uh, you know, credible information being being provided. So that, that's obviously what the, uh, that's the manufacturer's responsibility to do that. Um, and to, to make sure that's, that, that's available to make that specification process uh, easier when it comes to topics like this. Yeah, I think it's, uh, of course, there's a lot, there's many, many tricky technical issues and, and, and legal issues, but 
if we can promote uh, bonuses for choosing recycled and, and reusing, I think that would be excellent if you can make that um, you know a carrot. And I think that probably will happen in in the you know in the public sector more and more, which will be really interesting to see how it works. Um, maybe we will have a bit of time uh, at the end now uh, to try uh, a second uh, poll uh, for our attendees, so they can, we can uh, see also what they think. Um, Joe, can you can you put that up? Um, so the question is, um, in the lighting sector, um, which aspects of the circular economy do we need to focus the most on today? So it's really about uh, priorities there. So uh, the first option is uh, that we need more transparency but from the manufacturers on uh, the materials that they're using. Or second option, um, we need a longer product life and uh, availability of spare parts. Or third option, uh, better recyclability and uh, repairability of products. I think all these three are quite uh, quite important, but maybe we'll see some uh, some priorities that uh, we can have. So just pick uh, pick the one that you feel the most important. Um, do you have a view on this, uh, Matthew? Okay, I was I was asked first last time, but I'm very happy to go uh, on this one as well. I mean, I've you know I've mentioned quite a lot about the you know the transparency of information. So if I was answering this on the poll, I would go for the improved product life, honestly. Um, uh, you know, on the, the the second part, because you know if you, if you can make something with you know the right performance, consistent performance, last for longer, there is a real sustainability there, and then. Coming in, linking in with the points that have been made by by Kevin and, and Christian, uh, then you know if an end user wants to transfer those same products later on, x years later, to a second part of the the project because there is some uh, you know change of use maybe of that that space, and another application is needed or another lighting tool, if you like, is needed for that application, then you know it can be continue continue to be used. Kevin, would you like to comment on this one? Um, I think it's probably clear from what I've been said, improved product life and availability of spare parts is my vote on this one for definite. Uh, that is, you know, really we've got, you know, to make circular economy work, we've got to go to the first thing, which is, you know, reuse uh, or continue in use or just have things that have a life that uh, really are, are worth doing. So, I mean, it's difficult because the, th the third one, the repairability of products also comes into this improved product life, ability to spare parts. So, yeah, that's where I stand on it. I would say yes to all. <laughs> yes to all. But, uh, yeah, uh, it is... Um, whether it's better recyclability and that I think and repairability, I think it's really um, very, very important. It's, it's of course, improved product life uh, and availability of spare parts is, is yes. And, and more information. I mean, we need it all. So the, the results uh, we can see is that uh, actually majority of people, 55%, uh, think that uh, the most important uh, aspect would be better recyclability and, and the repairability of products uh, way ahead before 31% uh, on improved product life and uh, availability of spare parts. Um, so uh, we are on top of the hour, so uh, we will conclude our uh, webinar today. I would like to thank uh, very much to all our three uh, panelists. Thank you for your time and dedication. Uh, thank you also to all our attendees. We've got a lot of uh, questions and, and uh, comments, well, also mostly 
so that that will be uh, quite useful also for our work uh, going forward. And if you still have any comments or questions or or uh, feedback on this webinar, please get in touch uh, uh, through our email, uh, which is ild uh, at uh, ildeurope.com. Um, so thank you very much again, um, and I hope. Uh, you will be able to join uh, another webinar of ILD uh, in the future. All right. Thank you and have a great rest of the day. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye, everybody.